بسم الله السلام عليكم ورحمة الله Just like to welcome welcome everyone here this evening, Cherry Hill, to GCLEA. It is a great privilege to host this size of a group uh, with this esteemed guest of ours. Uh, before we get started, just want to ask our religious director, Sheikh Rashid Ahmadi, uh, a fellow alumnus of the Islamic University of Medina. Uh, to introduce the topic for you this evening and also to introduce our esteemed guest. Zakallah khair. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Alhamdulillahi alladhi ja'ala ummatana wasatan linakuna shuhada' ala al-nas وصلى الله وسلم وبارك على خير البرية وعلى آله وصحبه وبعد we'd like to welcome our esteemed guests to GCLEA we sincerely ask Allah Azza wa Jal to reward you for coming here this evening and taking part in this blessed gathering our discussion this evening will revolve around three major topics that are essential to our growth in America. One, preserving tradition. Two, sustaining community. Three, influencing opinion. And here to discuss this great topic is a very distinguished and honored guest and scholar whom we've personally benefited from tremendously the past 16 years, Sheikh Tahir Wayat. And we know he's not happy with that, but the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, and treat people according to their stature. And may Allah Azza wa Jal increase our Sheikh and preserve him. And as many of you already know, the Sheikh is a native of Philadelphia, the city of brotherly love. And there's a lot of love here, alhamdulillah, we feel it. The Shaykh, after being guided to Islam at a very young age, Allah blessed him again and allowed him to traverse the path of seeking knowledge in 1996. And he has been studying the city of the Prophet for over 21 years. And at that time, he has procured several degrees and is currently a PhD candidate at the Islamic University of Medina. And the Shaykh, Hafizullah Ta'ala, in 2013, was appointed by a royal decree to teach at the Prophet's Masjid, and that's becoming the first American ever to do so. And he is also the head of the translation department at the Prophet's Masjid, where he interprets the weekly sermon, the weekly Friday sermons at the Masjid. And so much can be said about our noble Shaykh and his accomplishments and how influential he has been. However, this is not the setting for that. So without any further ado, we will hand the mic over to our esteemed Shaykh Tahir Wayat, may Allah preserve him. Alhamdulillah, Ahmadu wa nasta'inu wa nasta'gfiru wa na'udhu billahi min shurur anfusina wa sayyati amalina may ahdihi Allah fala mudillala wa may yudlil fala hadiya lah wa ashhadu an la ilaha illallah wahdahu la sharika lah وأشهد أن محمدا عبده ورسوله صلى الله عليه وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم تسليما كثيرا إلى يوم الدين أما بعد I know I'm not supposed to start like this but I, I have to say um, that the western approach to introducing people is really not Islamic at all and I know that we've adopted that, even in the Muslim world, it's been adopted from the West to 
you know, mention a person's accomplishments in front of their face. But the reality is, is that that is not from our deen. We've adopted that. It's done in the, it's done in the Muslim world. But it was adopted from here. And that's because people here like to hear themselves praised. Uh, but that's very pretentious. And, and as Muslims, we should not want to hear anyone else praises because whatever we've done for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is for Allah. And inshallah will be accepted by him. And those things that were not for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, no matter how great they may seem, it, it has no weight with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and it may be used against the person. So I just want to uh, correct something because the Rashid, Jazallah Khaylan, you know, said that I am a scholar, I'm not a scholar. Um, I'm here to hopefully benefit you brothers and sisters with uh, some of what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has blessed me to learn. The topic that I was asked to talk about is, is an interesting title. It says, Moderate Muslims in Modern America. And I think that before we get to the topic of modern America, we have to take a step back and look at the issue of moderate Muslims. We also have to consider in light of that what our responsibility as Muslims in general is. What is our responsibility? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala clear, clearly defined that in the Quran. Allah azza wa jal said, inna aradna al-amanata ala samawati وَالْأَرْضِ وَالْجِبَالِ فَأَبَيْنَ أَنْ يَحْمِلْنَهَا وَأَشْفَقْنَ مِنْهَا وَحَمَلَهَا الْإِنسَانِ إِنَّهُ كَانَ ظَلُومًا جَهُولًا Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said that the amana, which is normally translated as trust, but here the amana refers to accepting the commands and prohibitions of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That is that Allah gave this offer to the heavens and to the earth and to the mountains that if they fulfilled his commands and avoided his prohibitions that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala would reward them with Jannah. Allah azza wa jal says, فَأَشْفَقَنَ مِنْهَا but they were extremely apprehensive and scared to accept this amana. وَحَمَلَهَا insan. But man took on that trust of obeying Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala with the promise, and Allah does not break his promise, with the promise that if we did so, that Allah would reward man with jannah. Then he says, in describing man who has accepted that trust, innahu kana dhaluman jahula. Man has been a dhalim, dhalum. He has the trait of dhulm, which I'll explain in a second. Because we normally translate dhulm as what? Injustice, transgression. But it means something a little, a little bit deeper than that. And he has the trait of al jahl, which means ignorance. All right. Now, I'll get to that in a second, inshallah. So, this is the amana that mankind has taken on. Allah then describes people who have taken on that trust, man who has taken on that trust, breaks them down into three categories. There are those who externally or openly, apparently accepted that trust, but internally they rejected it. And then there are those who rejected it externally and internally, they didn't even pretend. And then there are those who accepted that message or accepted that amana, both internally and externally. But they have their shortcomings. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, 
والمنافقات والمشركين والمشركات ويتوب الله على المؤمنين والمؤمنات وكان الله غفورا رحيما كان الله غفورا رحيما so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says breaks down mankind into three categories as it relates to this amana, this trust that we have taken on. The result of that, yani the result of taking that amana on is that Allah will punish accordingly the hypocrites, both male and female, and the mushrikeen, the idolaters, both male and female, and he will accept the repentance of the believers, male and female. And Allah is ghafoor rahim He is the all-forgiving and the most merciful. To take a step back, how did Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala describe man? He says that man is zaluman jahula. That man has these two qualities of propensity for dhul which we normally translate as injustice, but, but again, it's, it's deeper than that. So, if we were to look at the soul of a human being, and we and he didn't look at it as an abstract object, like the Prophet ﷺ said when he talked about the cleansing of the believer through salat, and he said that if one of you went to a river, and he bathed in that river five times a day. Would there be any dirt left on him? And they said no. He said this is the like of the Muslim who prays five times a day. Not that it's a physical cleaning, but that your soul is being cleansed. So when we talk about dhul, we are talking about the injustice that one does to himself and to others. Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says multiple times in the Quran, فَقَدْ ظَلَمَ nafsa. Whoever does this or that, he has made dhul of himself. A person who lies does what? He does dhul to himself. A person who is arrogant, he does dhul to himself. A person who is stingy is doing dhul to himself. So these are like stains that are coming on a person's soul. Those stains have to be cleansed. I want you to stay with me here because this is an important point, Ikhwan, before we start talking about the moderate and and the modern. All right? So we have dhul. We get, we get the picture of dhul. It, it is you are oppressing yourself. You have that propensity. And the jahl, which is ignorance. Okay? In order for man, because this is man in general, mankind, in order for us to remove that inclination towards dhul and ignorance, there's only one way that we can do that. And that is to follow the messengers of Allah. And this is why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent his messengers, all of them, and to remove dhul and to remove ignorance. This is why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent all of the messengers. This is why he sent our messenger Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and he clarified what his mission was before the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa was created, before his father was created, before his grandfather was created. So when Ibrahim alayhi salatu wa sallam finished building the Kaaba, he made a dua. He said, Rabbana wa ba'ath feehim rasoolan minhum yatlu alayhim ayati." Oh Allah, send amongst them. Who was them? He was in Mecca. Send amongst them a messenger from them who recites to you, who recites to them your verses. And he teaches them and he does what? Purifies them. Teaches them because they are ignorant purifies them because they have stained themselves with dhul. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala answered that dua in Surah Al-Jum'ah. Huwa alladhi ba'adha fil ummiyyina rasoolan minhum yatlu alayhim ayatihi wa yuzakihim wa yu'allimuhum al-kitab wal-hikmah wa in kanu min qablu lafi dalalim mubin 
So, so, so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, He is the one who sent amongst the unlettered, the ummiyeen, a messenger from amongst them, reciting to them his verses and purifying them. Because the first quality that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala described man with was what? Dhul or jahl, which one? Dhul. Yuzakihim, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said. Purifying them to remove them of the dhul that they have with them, that injustice, whether that is to themselves or to others. And he teaches them the book, and he teaches them the hikmah, he teaches them the wisdom, meaning the sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ, like Imam al-Shafi, rahimahullah ta'ala said. So the job, the mission of our messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, was to remove from us this propensity and this inclination towards dhul or injustice and towards ignorance. And this coincides directly with the statement of the Prophet ﷺ who said, خَصْلَتَانِ لَا تَجْتَمِعَانِ فِي مُنَافِقِ حُسْنُ سَمْتٍ وَفِقْهٌ فِي الدِّينِ that there are two qualities that will never be combined in a hypocrite. Good character and fiqh in the religion, to have understanding of the deen. And that is because if a person has both good character, he has a degree of, of tazkiyah, of purification, and if he has understanding of the religion, then he has a degree of knowledge. Tayyib, you with me so far? Tayyib, what was the amana? What is the amana? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Because we, we have to understand something. You know, we, we want to talk about very advanced topics and, and, and interesting titles. But the reality is first, before we get to that, we have to make sure we're on the same page. And this is like... Islam 101. What is this aman? What is it? What does that mean? The trust. What trust do we have? Anybody, huh? That, that man accepted from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that he would fulfill his commands and avoid his prohibition with the promise that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reward him with gender. What did Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, what two traits did Allah use to describe man in that same verse? Dhulm and jahl, what's dhulm? Injustice, okay, we'll, we'll let that ride. And, and jahl is, and jahl is ignorance. And the messengers were sent to do what? To remove that. And how is that removed with what? Huh? Again? With tezkiyah and ilm, tezkiyah purification and knowledge. Now, many of you who were around in the 90s may remember that as tasfiyah and tarbiyah, right? But Allah Azza wa Jal using the Quran, tezkiyah and ta'lim. This, this is the Quranic terminology for that concept that we need to purify ourselves and we need to learn the deen of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and this is a life-long pursuit for everybody who does not want to be from the munafiqeen and the munafiqat and the mushrikeen and the mushrikat, and who want to be from amongst the mu'mineen and the mu'minat. And the, the lowest level, if you will, of purification is husnul khuluq. Husnu Semtin, as the Prophet described it. Is that, is that, is that, is that we that have, have good character. character? And a lot of times, unfortunately, we give a lot of attention to the external. How this person looks, how neat her hijab is, how short or long his stove is, and all of the other things that have its degree of importance in Islam, because we're not going to say anything in Islam is insignificant. But the reality is, is that the Prophet said, in the fil jasad, fil jasad, inside of your body, there is a mudra, there's a piece of flesh. If it's right, 
then everything else is going to be right. And so working on character is a very important part of our deed. Being truthful, being trustworthy, being generous, being humble, this is part of our deed. We have to work on it. And that's the lowest form of Tezke, and that's something that all of us have to strive for. The lowest form of knowledge that we have to strive for is the knowledge that is obligatory upon us. Now, there's some knowledge that is obligatory upon every Muslim, that no Muslim is excused from. Like, who is Allah, subhanahu wa ta'ala, knowing your Lord, Jalla Jalla. Knowing what la ilaha illallah means. And this is, this is part of your deen. There are other aspects of our deen that may be obligatory for some of us and not others. So if you have wealth, then you need to know how to pay the cash. It's, it's, it's an obligation, meaning if you don't know, then you're sinful. That's what an obligation means. If you don't know it, then you are sinful. So I'll give you a quick test real quick. Somebody has, somebody makes $200,000 a year. Huh? What? Got to get the calculator? I don't think so. Like, okay, 100000 Somebody makes 100000 a year. How much do they have to pay for Zakat? 2500 subhanAllah. So everybody failed that. Sorry? 2.5% of what? Of 100000 Two, time out, time out. 2.5% 2. 2. of 100000 is 2500 right? But it's wrong. Because it doesn't matter how much money he makes. It matters what his surplus is. He may earn 100000 and his expenses may be 120000 So he's actually eligible for zakat. He doesn't have to pay zakat. But it is obligatory for those who have wealth to know this about their deen, besides the fact that it's the third pillar of Islam. So for, for women, they have a whole side of fiqh that is wajib for them to know. For, I mean, yeah, the, the list goes on. So the, the reality is, is that there are certain parts of Islam that some of us may need to know and others are exempt from, from understanding that aspect of the deen. But if, and, and, this, and this varies. This is why seeking knowledge is a lifelong pursuit. So you may not have enough money to make hajj this year, but you have enough to make it next year or two years later. It becomes your obligation to learn how to make hajj. Not to wait till you get on hajj and just watch what everybody else is doing. Play. All right. So that is as it relates to what is obligatory from uh, those two aspects of our deen, which is knowledge and, and purification. Knowledge and purification. Then there has to be, from amongst the ummah, so that, that we would call that fard, what? Ain, fard, ain. Everybody, everybody has to know certain aspects of, of the deen. Then we have what is fard kifaya. I mean, that is that at least some part of the ummah has to strive to reach the highest level of tezkiyah, of purification, which is sabr. Sabr, which is three categories. I'm not going to go into all of them. I mean, we normally translate sabr as, as patience, but it means having forbearance and being steadfast in obeying Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and avoiding his prohibitions and being patient and even pleased with, with his decree. That is the highest level of, of tezkiyah. The highest level of ilm, of knowledge, is certainty. Yaqeen. And some of us, I mean, some of the ummah, has to strive to get to that level. If we were to look at it as, let's just use the example of swimming. Everybody has to tread. Everybody has to learn how to tread so that they don't what? Drown. You don't have to learn how to swim, but you got to at least know how to do the doggy paddle so you can stay above water. Then others are going to learn how to swim. They're better off than those who are just treading. But then we need people who, when the, those who are treading start running out of breath and they start falling short and they're going under, we need other people that can come in and help lift them back up. 
right? Or some of them may have been swimming and they lost their possessions. So we need somebody that can go down and, and get their things from the bottom of the, the pool or whatever, right? So this is the case. This is the case with the ummah. Everybody has to have that degree of knowledge that keeps them above, above water. When they start sinking, we need to have other people who can come in and serve as the lifeguards or whatever we want to call it. And this is why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, وَجَعَلْنَا مِنْهُمْ أَئِمَّةً يَهْدُونَ بِأَمْدِنَا لَمَّا صَبَرُوا وَكَانُوا بِآيَاتِنَا يُوْقِنُونَ And we made from amongst them أَئِمَّة يعني إِمَامَةً Leaders لَمَّا صَبَرُوا When they had sabr وَكَانُوا بِآيَاتِنَا يُوْقِنُونَ And they were patient عفواً And they had certainty about our signs so there's sabr and certainty. With those two things, you become an imam in the deen. And this is why Shaykh al-Islam and Taymiyyah rahimahullah ta'ala said, with sabr and yaqeen, tunalu al-imamatu fi deen. With sabr and yaqeen, you reach al-imamah. You reach that status of al-imamah in the deen. And that does not mean, I want to be very clear on this point, that does not mean that everybody in the ummah has to go out and go to the Arabian Peninsula and sit for six years or ten years and study the deen of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and everybody is going to dedicate their entire lives to the study of deen. The community can't function like that. And it didn't work like that at the time of the Prophet Not everybody was seeking knowledge in the sense that they dedicated their entire lives to that. We still need people in all other areas for us to function as a community. And that's why I said that there's a degree of knowledge that is obligatory upon everyone. And that degree of knowledge does not necessarily mean that somebody is going to go pick up a book and study it from cover to cover. It may mean that they ask someone who is more knowledgeable to them than them and receive clarity about that so that they can practice, that they can practice their deen. But the, but, 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 but the, the other the issue is, because we have that extreme, we have, we have some, some people that make that people make feel, 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 feel like, like if they are they not, are not, not dedicating, dedicating their entire their lives, 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 lives to the study, study of the deed, the then they're, 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 they're worthless. worthless, 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 worthless and, that, and that's an extreme. That's extreme. extreme, 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 extreme. But we have another extreme. That is those who give, they don't care anything about it. They're totally apathetic to the concept of knowledge. And for them, the, the issue of, of knowledge is one where they feel like they have the right to interpret the religion for themselves. That is, that they are totally apathetic to the concept of knowledge, and they feel that they can come and say, or believe anything that they want about the statement of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala or his messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. To move on to the topic of the moderate Muslims in modern America, I will be frankly honest with everyone. And that is, I don't believe that we need a qualifier for Muslim. I don't, need, I don't think that we need to qualify it as moderate. And the reason why I say that is because Islam is intrinsically moderate. Moderate in the sense of balance. That, we, that Islam is, has always been in the middle and has avoided both extremes. And if we look at the statement of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wa tammat kalimatu rabbika sidqan wa adala that the word of your Lord has been fulfilled or completed in truth and in justice and justice means what? that it is balanced and the word of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the Quran as the scholars of tafsir say so the Quran is both truthful and balanced if we look at that story that many of you know of the three men who went to some of the wives of the Prophet and they inquired about his worship. 
and they heard a, they heard moderation. And they said, but who are we next to? The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi him he's been forgiven of all of his sins. Those that have preceded and those which are to come. So one of them said, I'm going to pray all night. I'm not going to sleep at night. And the other one said, I'm going to fast round the clock. Not meaning that he's going to fast his entire life. He's going to fast every day for the rest of his life. And I'm never going to break my fast. I'm going to fast 300 and 55 days in a lunar year, all right? And then there was another one who said, I am not going to marry. I'm not going to marry anybody. In other words, he's going to dedicate himself totally to the worship of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and not get married. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa when he heard about them, he said, who is it from amongst you who has said such and such? I, wallahi, he said, by Allah, I'm the one from amongst you who has the most taqwa and the most fear of Allah. And I pray at night and I sleep. And I fast some days and I don't fast other days. And I get married. Then he said, So whoever rejects my sunnah is not from me. He's not from me. What does that mean? That whoever takes a path that is not balanced, then he is not following a path of the sunnah, nor is he following a path of the Qur'an. Because the Qur'an is balanced, the sunnah of our Prophet is balanced. And this was understood very well by the early Muslims of Islam. If we look at this story, we know that when the Prophet got to Medina, you know he stopped in Quba. They built Masjid Quba before the Prophet actually got there. And then the Prophet went forward and he built his own masjid. But he did something between the Muhajirin and the Ansarul Muhajirin, by the way. The migrants, where did they migrate from? Where? I know it's not just two people answering. The Muhajirin, they migrated from where? To where? To Medina. Okay. When they got to Medina, there were Muslims there. What were they called? The Ansar. Okay, excellent. All right, so we had the Muhajirin and the Ansar. The Prophet ﷺ, he built the bond of brotherhood between the Muhajirin and the Ansar. And that, that's an important social aspect of Islam, by the way, but we don't have a lot of, a lot of time to talk about. But if you, if you consider it, the, the Prophet ﷺ, two of the ones that he yeah, and he built that bond of brother to the point that they used to inherit from one another, by the way, in the beginning of Islam. They were like blood. The Prophet ﷺ made that relationship between Abu Darda and Salman. Salman al-Farisi and Abu Darda. Which one of them was from the Muhajiri? Huh? Abu Darda was from the Ansar. Abu Darda was from the Ansar. Salman al farisi came to the Prophet when he was in Mecca. And then he made Hijrah. Okay, so one day Salman al farisi he went to the house of Abu Darda, because that was his brother. And Umm Darda opened the door and she had on shabby clothes. And he said, what's, what's wrong with you, uh, Umm Darda? And she said, your brother has... No hajjah in the dunya. Right? He, has not, he doesn't even want anything in the dunya. And so he went to Abu Darda, and Abu Darda cooked the meal for him and presented the food to him, and he told him to eat. He said, I'm not eating until you eat. He said, I'm fasting. He said, I'm not eating until you eat, and so he broke his fast, and he ate with him. That night, he went to sleep. Abu Darda woke up. Salman noticed that he woke up. He says, Sip, go back to sleep. So Abu Darda went back to sleep. Why do you think he went back to sleep? Salman was from the Muhajirin. The Muhajirin are better than the Ansar. They were with the Prophet in the beginning when there was no, you know, Islam was the majority in Medina. And in Mecca, they had to go through some real trials. That's why there were no Munafiqeen in Mecca. There weren't any hypocrites in Mecca. So Salman said, sit back, go, go back to sleep. So he got up again, go back to sleep. He got up in the latter part of the night, and, he, and then he prayed with him. It comes a narration of Bukhari. So Salman prayed with, with Abu Darda. And then he told him, he said, Inna li rabbika alayka haqqan. Your Lord has a right over you. 
And you have, your body يعني, has a right over you. And you need to get some sleep. I need to take that advice. Seriously. And your family has a right over you. So give each one its due. Give each one its due. So Abu Darda went to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. He told him what Salman said. And the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam says, Sadaqa Salman. Salman told the truth. That's balance. That's balance. The Islam is intrinsically balanced without us having to add the term moderate. And I wanted to bring up that point because some people confuse the term moderate the way that we're using it or balanced with the word progressive. Yani that is that the, the progressive Muslim movement who quite frankly would, would prefer to reinterpret or mold or distort Islam such that it, it, it coincides with whatever narrow vision they have of what is beneficial. Because no doubt Islam has come to bring benefit. But if they don't see the benefit in something, then they say it's not from Islam. And if they do see the benefit in something that they know Islam has prohibited, then they try to make it halal. And it's the same thing that has happened in every other religion, like the Prophet Wasallam said to Adi ibn Hatim, or as the ayat was revealed, اتخذوا أحبارهم وربانهم أرباب من دون الله. They take, they've taken their scholars and their, their monks as, as arbab, as lords besides Allah. And what, this, what was that? They made what was halal, haram, and they made what was haram, halal. And that was part of their distortion of the religion. So if we want to keep a balanced Islam, we have to preserve it from extremism. Whether that extreme is to the right or that extreme is to the left. And that's, that's very important that we understand. It. Because some people believe that to, that to avoid extremism, that we have to go all the way to the left. And then other people believe that we need to err on the side of caution, and so they go extremely harsh. And shaitan does not care what side of the road you go on as long as you don't go down the middle. That's very important for us to understand. The middle course is a snake. And this is why yani, when, when shaitan was uh, removed from Jannah, expelled from Jannah, and he and took he man took as an enemy. enemy, enemy, enemy. He, he, he said, said to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, من بين from in front of them, then I'm, I'm going to come to them, from in front of them, woman خلفهم, and from behind them, وعن أيمانهم وعن شمائلهم, ولا تجد أكثر من شاكرهم. And then I'm going to come to them from the right and from the left, and you won't find that most of them are thankful. So if you get pulled to the right or to the left, it doesn't really matter, as long as you don't travel down the middle path. That's why it is critical for us as Muslims to travel that path that is down the middle. So if we go back to our obligation as, as Muslims, we have an obligation to strive for both purification and to strive for knowledge and that is that is our identity as muslims that is what we talk about when we talk about stabilizing a a muslim identity for ourselves and for the generations to come because because of Juan, brothers and sisters in islam this is this is our obligation towards our children you know, our Prophet والسلام, said to us, he was talking to this ummah, it is enough of a, of, of a sin that a person, and I'm going to translate this literally, waste those who depend upon him. Yani he, just, he loses them and he wastes them. And, and this, is, this is our responsibility, that we don't lose our generation. That's a sin. 
that we preserve this identity, that we create and support and maintain the institutions that have been put in place to preserve knowledge and to preserve purification. It's very important that we understand this point here. If we, if we don't recognize that this starts in the home, because we, we have to recognize that the first institutions, the first institutions are, are the homes. It, it is not the school, it is not the, the, the ma'had or, or this, high, this seminary or, no, it is the home. That is the first place where your child is going to learn to either respect Islam or to have a, you know, wishy-washy opinion of Islam. So it is your obligation to lead by example. Don't drop your kid off at the masjid on Sunday and leave it to the teacher at the Sunday school who sees your child two hours out of the week and then when your child is not practicing Islam the way that you think he should, then you come and you blame the Islamic studies teacher at the masjid. Or you want your child to be in tahfid and he's never seen you read the Quran outside of Ramadan. How are they supposed to develop a love for the deen if they don't see deen being practiced? If they see you lying to other people, because being truthful is from this deen. And the Prophet said, That lying leads to just being obscene and corrupt, and that leads to the hellfire. From our deen is to be truthful. If your kids see you lying, how are you supposed to enforce them being truthful? Because this is our deen. All right? So, so our homes are important. We cannot come and expect our children to have a reverence for purification and for knowledge, which is what we're here for, that worship of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. If you tell them, no, no, don't fast today because you have football practice. It's Ramadan. This is part of your deen. Is it, is it really worth it that they not fast and they leave off a pillar of Islam? So that they can go to football practice? Or so that they can run a race? Or any of that? I mean, we, we have to be very you know, keen on this issue that the home is the first Islamic institution. And we, 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 that is the, the, the parents. We have to do a better job of setting that example. But there's no doubt that the Islamic schools you know, when we talk about K to 12, that they play a very vital role in enforcing this Islamic identity and stabilizing that Islamic identity. By a show of hands, how many of you have school age children? No, no, like real high, not like this. Yeah, okay. Tight. No, keep them up. Keep, 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 please, keep, keep them up. They'll go down in a minute. Watch. Keep them up. No, no, come on, Jabril. Put the hand up. All right. Tight. No, 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 keep them up, keep them, it's not, a, it's not that long, it's, okay, just keep them up. You have school-age children, okay, keep them up. How many of you have all of your school-age children in Islamic school? All of them, alhamdulillah, that's about 2%, mashallah. Play, down. Sorry? Sorry. <laughs> yeah, homeschool counts, fine. Play. No, no, now I have a question, because I'm not going to bash you for not having your children in a, not in a, you know, not in an Islamic school. But I do, I want to know the reason why. Why don't, for just, just like, let's have a frank discussion. Why don't you have your kids in Islamic school? Or all of them? The cost. Okay, so it's, it's expensive. Since it's a private institution, it's expensive. Anything else? Come on, let's be real. Come on. It's worse than public school. In what sense? Okay, so you're saying even from a moral perspective that the only thing Islamic about the Islamic school is the name. Okay, got you. Mashi. The academics. Okay, so it may offer an Islamic environment, but they're not learning much, is what you like in terms of like secular sciences and things like this. 
Anything else? Anything else? Yes. 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 There aren't enough of them around. Yeah, the the location. location. I mean, it's, too, it's too far of a distance. Yes. yes. Preservation of character. So, so by sending them to the Islamic schools, they're losing character, you're saying? There's nothing Islamic about it but the name, basically. But it goes back to, it goes back to this. Here's the, here's, the, here's, the, here's the reality. Our schools are underfunded. That, that's the bottom line. Anybody that has worked within the Islamic school system knows that the schools are underfunded. There's just not enough money to hire qualified people or enough qualified people. So our schools are underfunded. But, but Ikhwan, we, we do have, we, ha we have to start funding these schools differently. If, if we look at the best private schools in this country, they only take 55%, 55% of their uh, budget is based on tuition. And the other 45% comes from endowments and grants and fundraisers where necessary, which I'll talk about in a minute, inshallah. Okay? But the reality is, is that if you can't hire qualified people, you can't make them a comparable offer. You're offering them half of what they would make somewhere else. All right? Then what happens is you're not going to get that quality education, which means that the people who have the money who want their children to go to a good school are not going to pay for them to go to that school. You then have to cap off your salary, uh, your, your, your tuition at a certain price so that you can attract a different crowd, and then the cycle continues. And so we don't have the proper schools that are going to help reinforce what we are trying to teach them in the home. Because then what happens is, if you send your child to a public school, you're sending them to a place that is not going to give them anything to reinforce their Islamic identity. We don't share the same values. They, these schools are teaching moral relativism, which means, which means in, a, in, a, in a nutshell, that morality changes from time to time. So what so may what have may been have moral been yesterday is not necessarily not moral today and vice versa. versa. And so our so children, our children are, are, are gaining are all of these all type of thoughts, 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 thoughts which make them, make them doubt, doubt Islam. Islam. And then we and then wonder, wonder well, what, what's, happening what's happening to my child? child, 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 child. But they're not in an institution, in eight, eight hours a day, they're in an, in an institution that if it is not, it's definitely not reinforcing their Islam, it may be taking away from their Islamic identity. So we, we have the responsibility to step up and make sure that we can create the type of institutions educationally that support our children as well as, and this is the next step, and I'll just put it out there and, and then move on inshallah ta'ala because of time. As well as creating institutions of higher learning that are secular in nature but that are run in an Islamic environment. So we need two-year STEM colleges that are run by the Muslims, that, have, that, are, that are run Islamically, but that offer the sciences and technology and the other things that they're going to need to go into those fields that they, that they want to go into. But to get them at 18 and 19 years old and help reinforce that identity is, is critical, because when you send your child away, and, I, and I'm, I'm preaching to the choir, because the brothers who have done it and the sisters who have done it, they know. You send your child away to college at 18 and 19 years old, and, and there's a lot going on there. There's a lot going on. And so we, we have to be very careful. So we have these institutions. I want you to stay with me, inshallah, because we get into a critical point here. We have K through 12. This is just right now with, with us. We have certain institutes that maybe teach Arabic or other Islamic sciences. We may call them seminaries or whatever we call them. Inshallah, in the future, we will create institutes of higher learning. So we've had this identity that has been stabilized amongst the Muslims. Now the Muslims have to have a place to congregate. That place that they congregate is called what? It's called the masjid. The masjid is the hub 
for the Muslim. It is the bedrock of, of the Islamic existence in this country that we have masjids. And alhamdulillah, yani we've had masjids that have been built you know, for the last, uh, I don't know how many years in this country, but since the Muslims have been in this country for over 100 years, well, alhamdulillah. But I mean, you can see the masjids have spread, especially in the last 30 to 40 years. And nobody is going to deny the virtue of praying in the masjid. The Prophet ﷺ said that praying in the masjid is 25 times more, yani praying in jama'ah in the masjid is 25 times more the reward of praying solo by yourself. And by the way, if we put that in monetary terms, I think the masjid would be a lot more crowded most of the time. Right? Okay. Ten, I'll just give you an example. If someone offered you $10 an hour to work from home, okay, $100 an hour to work from home, would you take the job? Huh? You probably, you probably work from home for $100. You change your job? Okay. Play. If someone said, though, I'll give you $2,500 an hour, not $100 an hour, $2,500 an hour. But you can't work from home. You got to get in your car and you got to drive 10 minutes, work from the office. Would you take that job or would you stay in the house? Okay, pray in the masjid. All right, play. Now, the Prophet also said the importance of being in the masjid. No, because we need to understand the role of the masjid in Islam, because it's an important role. The Prophet said, Do not prevent the female slaves of Allah from going to the masjid. And Ibn Umar was the one who narrated this hadith, and his son heard him and he said, Nah, I'm not letting my wife go to the masjid. I'm not letting my wife go to the masjid. Ibn Umar said, I tell you that the Prophet said, And you tell me you're not letting your wife go to the masjid. And he refused to speak to his son, refused to speak to him. I mean, like, literally cut him off. Because the, the masjid is, is that important in Islam, that we, are, that we are afforded that opportunity to congregate. And the reality is that we're not all the same. We come from very different backgrounds, socioeconomic backgrounds, educational backgrounds, ethnic backgrounds, right? And so when we come together, there's a code of ethics that the Prophet ﷺ has, has enforced. And this is, that, this is what we talk about when we talk about character. Because part of character is protecting the rights of another Muslim. When you look at many of the books that deal with character, they start out with the same hadith, which is haqqul muslim al muslimi sit. That the rights of a believer over another, or the rights of a Muslim over another Muslim are six. And the Prophet ﷺ listed those rights. Because when we talk about character, we're talking about preserving the rights of your brother and not infringing upon his rights. Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, and aqimu deen, yani this was the, the message to all of the messages, to establish the deen, and don't be divided amongst yourselves in the deen. When does that division come when we infringe upon each other's rights? When we infringe upon each other's rights. And so that's why it's very important that we preserve each other's rights, especially in the houses of Allah, and that we create an environment that is, is welcoming, because that's part of our deen. It's part of our deen. So the, the masjid has a very vital role to play in the preservation of our identity as Muslims in this country, and it is the, the primary, primary educational center for the Muslims. And we talked about K through 12s and seminaries and this and that. But the majority of the Muslims are going to be learning their religion in the masjid because the masjid is dedicated to, to teaching a more general audience. The khutbah is delivered in the masjid. The, a lot of times the Quran is being recited in the masjid. It's taught to others in the masjid, memorizing it, learning the meanings of the Quran and so on and so forth. And if we are able to, by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, by, by Allah as we just leave, if we are able to make the masjid comfortable and we are able to provide people with the sound teachings of the Prophet and we create 
a welcoming environment, then people are going to come to the masjid. But when people come to the masjid, they need services. That's the reality. The masjid is not, I mean, our masjid here in, in this country have to evolve into Islamic centers where people are able to receive the counseling that they need and all of the other services that we need when we come together as a community. But that's only going to be a reality, and this is this point to me I'm passionate about. That's only going to be reality a reality if we wake up and recognize what our responsibility is. I'm going to stop here because I want you to think about something. Any, how many of you have been Muslim for at least 20 years? In this country, in this country. Muslim for at least 20 years. Okay, put your hands down. Do you see a major difference in the way that our masjids function today and the way that they functioned 20 years ago? I'm talking about how our masjids are sustained. Because when we start talking about offering services to people, that means that it requires people who offer those services which means we require some kind of income to have those people and services available. Today, the way that we fund our messages and our services are through what? How do we usually get our funds? Huh? Fundraisers, donations, alhamdulillah. They put those doors in yesterday, by the way, Juan. No, seriously, I'm, I'm, I'm actually being dead serious. You see the doors in the back? That used to be open. They put the doors in so that we can lock them today. Well, they didn't put it in for that reason. But, Yanni, that's a good idea. We lock them today and we fundraise. Nobody leaves until we get, we get the money, right? So, but, but that typically, because I, I, mean, I think we've all, we've lived that. When you get the big guy about 400 pounds, they put him at the door and they say nobody is leaving until, you know, that's the reality. That's how we raise funds. Donate. Everybody donates and donates. And we go around and we beg and ask people for money and things like this. Was it like that 20 years ago? Was it like that 30 years ago? Okay. And guess what it's going to be 20 years from now? Same thing unless we change. Unless we change that. Because to be honest with you, that's not from our history as Muslims is not from our history as Americans. This donors-based system that we're running our messages on is not sustainable. It's not sustainable. All right? Which is why we can't really, uh, our growth is so, it's, it's turtle slow because we keep operating the same way. And I, I want today, whatever today's date is, I want today to be the day that we turn the page on that system and that we move from a donor-based system towards an Islamic system, which is the system of Al-Oqaf, which I'll talk about briefly. The, 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 the way that the Masajid are funded, for all of you who have been over, overseas at all, have you ever seen anybody stand up after Jummah? and start asking people for money so that we can keep the, so we can keep the lights on, so that we can keep this on, so we, no? Never seen that overseas? That is because their masajid are funded by Oqaf, which we can loosely translate as endowments. And that, that's from our deen. Umar radiallahu ta'ala anhu, he, after the battle of Khaybar, Umar radiallahu anhu, had a, a very nice plot of land. It was a farm. It was farmland. And so he went to the Prophet. He wanted to, to give it away as Sadaq. The Prophet suggested to him, pay attention here. The Prophet suggested to him that he ihbis, yani, in shitta habasta asla. If you, if you will, you should habasta uh, asla. How do I train that? Hold on, hold on to the land, what to sadduk, and give away the fruits of that land, and the crops. Okay, so those crops, the land. Let's just say, let's just put a figure on. Let's just say the land is worth fifty thousand dollars. 
and the crops bring an annual yield of $10,000. So if he gave away, if he gave away the land, that would be a great thing, right? Because 50,000, that's good. But if he keeps the land and he gives away the yields of, that, of, that, of those crops, then now he's doing 10,000 this year and 10,000 the next year and 10,000 until today. Until today. Because that land, and Umar radiallahu ta'ala and who forbid that that land be sold or that it be given away as a gift or that it be inherited. So, this is, this is the concept of a waqf. Now, I'll give you a modern day example. You have a group of brothers who came together, and, and it's an exorbitant amount of money, but just stay with me. They put together $2 million. Now, a lot of us, if we had a group of brothers who could put that kind of money together, we want to bask in the glory of having the biggest master with the nicest dome, the minara, and, and the, the, the best uh, member, and the best everything, so that we could be the best Muslims, right? What these brothers did was they bought a strip mall, okay? Two million. Buy a strip mall. They put a part of the mall as a musalla. I mean, part of that strip mall. Just a, just a corner, enough for them to pray. On Jumai, was it big enough? No. But is any masjid big enough on Jumai? Just about no. Okay, the haram isn't big enough on Jumai. Okay? And then for every other salat, it was fine for them. It was fine for the regulars. Okay? So. What happened, what happened is, is that strip that mall generated, generated revenue, 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 400000 a year. They took the first part of the revenue they got, and they began to build luxury apartments that they would want to live in. Okay? And so now we've got, along with the strip mall, we've got these luxury apartments. Every year, we're getting revenue now from not only the strip mall, but also from the luxury apartments, and then they built their masjid. And they built the biggest one and the most expansive and everything else. But guess what? Because they were patient six, seven years, okay, they will never have to ask for money again. They have stability. They created a sustainable institution. Now, we may not have the luxury of doing that with our institutions because we already have institutions that have been built. But what we can do is to start thinking different and start looking at how we, in this room right here, are going to pull our resources together so that we can come up with a few hundred thousand dollars and not worry about buying another message but worrying about how to invest it in the best manner proper so that it brings a return that we can now use to start funding our current institutions that exist. And this is the concept of the wuk. Am I getting there? All right, I will try to... Uh, I'll try to summarize as best as possible. We get the concept of this waqf. No, because, because really, it's not just going to require religious leaders or investors. It is going to require educators and people in the healthcare profession and people in the computer sciences and all across the board. We, we are going to, to, in order to, what we're talking about here is a change. That it be idni la. We can look back in 20 years. Right now, our problem, our issue that we face is that we're underfunded. We can't provide some of the services that we'd like to provide to the community because we don't have enough money to do so. And if we stay the way that we're doing right now, it's going to be the same problem 20 years from now. What we want to do is change for, for the next generation. If we pull our resources together and we keep pushing the right way, our children will inherit institutions that are sustainable. They've already sustained themselves. And their problem will be how to manage bigger budgets. 
and how to provide better services and how to grow the institutions that already exist to meet the needs of their generation because in the latter, Muslims are going to keep growing. And we're not going to lose numbers. We're going to grow, inshallah. So this is something that we have to consider. I'll, I'll, I'll close out with this following point, inshallah ta'ala. Because uh, as Imam Rashid mentioned, we want to talk about, or, or it was suggested that we talk about influencing policy. I want you to understand something. As our institutions grow, and these here United States of America, we are going to have to learn how to engage with the community at large. Our masajid that we build, let's just keep it real. Our, we as Muslims in this country, are approximately 2% of the population. Correct or not? There's no census whatsoever that, that puts the Muslims at 3%. Even if you said the Muslims at 10 million, which is the highest number I've ever heard, there are 340 million people in America, so that doesn't even put us at 3%. That means that our institutions in general are going to be surrounded by non-Muslim institutions. What are we going to be known for as Muslims? What are we known for as Muslims? No, let, let, okay, let's, let's start there. What are we known for right now, the Muslims? Huh? Terrorists? No, that, that, that's true. But even for the people, forget, forget the media stuff. Our neighbors know us for what? Double parking, yes. What else? Sorry? Oh, wow, I'm not going there. I'm not going there. Huh? Sorry? No, he didn't. And I'm not going there either. Huh? Sorry? We're known for masters. Okay, so we're known for being, making noise early in the morning. Ramadan, we're known for making noise, noise late at night. Definitely for double parking, yes. Being strict? Okay, being strict, we clog up the, the if we're in a residential neighborhood, we always clog up the sidewalk. You know, they can never get by. We never give the road its rights, the Prophet said, right? This is, right? this is basically about, and I'm not saying we're not doing any good. I'm not, and I'm, I'm not saying that, because alhamdulillah, we do as, as Muslim institutions, many of the Muslim institutions do offer things to the community. And I know that some of us are saying, who cares what the Catholics think anyway, right? No, seriously. But, but if we think about it, that's, that was not the attitude of the Prophet Sallallahu and we, and we need to be, we need to be, you know, we need to understand this point. When the Abyssinian, the Habishans were playing with their spears in the Masjid, and Aisha on, on the Eid, and Aisha radiallahu ta'ala anha, you know, came and she basically put her cheek on the cheek of the Prophet sallallahu because she wanted to see what they were doing and she was intrigued by it. You know, you know, Abu Bakr, Abu Bakr Allah, 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 who was Aisha's father, he was, he was a bit upset. He said they playing in the masjid of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, what are they doing? Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, Da'hu, leave them. Li'alam al-Yahud, anna fi deenina fusha. So that the Jews know that we have some leeway in our deen. This is our Eid. But, but the point here is, so that what? So that the Jews know. It's not that the Prophet wasallam stopped practicing his deen. You know, because we, we have some people take this hadith and they say, I'm not praying at work. Because I don't want people to think I'm a terrorist. Dude, if Salat goes in and out, then you need to pray at work. And it doesn't matter what anybody thinks, right? But the, the reality is that we do have to be conscious of the way that what we are doing is being perceived by the people around us. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, at one point when the man came and he grabbed the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam by his collar and, and Umar radiallahu ta'ala and he was a munafiq, he was a hypocrite, right? But a hypocrite is what? He's somebody who displays Islam and internally he's not a Muslim. Okay. Umar radiallahu ta'ala and who said to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, da'ani adribu unuqa. O Messenger of Allah, let me take care of that for you. That's how I'll translate it. Let me take care of him for you. And the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, 
We're not going to let the people say that Muhammad kills his followers. Okay. Do you think that the Prophet really cared what somebody thinks about him? Or was this because it would be a deterrent for people entering into the deen? And so we have to be conscious of that. We don't exist in a bubble. We are 2% of the population, and everybody else around us is not Muslim. And this is what, this is what our test is in this country that we display Islam in the best manner possible. People in other countries have their tests. You may have chosen or not chosen to be here, just like you didn't choose to be a male or a female or anything else. This is your test. This is what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tested you with, and we have to deal with that. We live here in a land where people are not Muslims. And so we have to be able to live Islam in a manner that at least does not deter them, at least does not deter them from wanting to be part of this ummah because this is where their salvation lies. It lies in them seeking knowledge and purifying themselves, the same way it is for us. And we want for them what we want for ourselves. They are our people. No matter what way we slice it, they are our people. And this is why every prophet, and if you look in sort of Araf, for example, in Surah Hud, where it talks about the stories of the prophet, Prophets. Those prophets were sent to a people who were not Muslim, and they would say to them, Yeah, call me. Oh, my people. Oh, my people. These are our people. And it's our duty to be better examples of Muslims, to encourage them to enter into the deen of, of, of Islam and not have the attitude that we are Sha'bullah al Muqtah, you know, that we are Allah's chosen people, and that these people are going to hell anyway. We, can, we cannot have that attitude. And if we look in the seerah of our Prophet and even some of his companions, if you look at Abu Bakr radiallahu ta'ala anhu, when the Muslims were forced out of Mecca, that first hijrah that they made to, to Habasha, to Abyssinia, uh, Abu Bakr, as he was going south and he was heading towards, uh, he was heading towards Habasha, he ran into a man who was the, the head of his tribe. His name was Ibn Dighinna. And Ibn Dighinna knew Abu Bakr al-Siddiq from trade. And he said to him, and where exactly are you going? And he said, my people have forced me out. And so I'm going to Habasha so that I can worship Allah. Ibn Dighinna said, you, people like you do not leave, nor are they to be forced out. I am your protector. You are under my protection. And he went physically back with Abu Bakr to Mecca, which was a five-day journey. And he went to each of the Ashraf al-Quraysh, or the nobles from amongst the Quraysh, and he told them that Abu Bakr is under my protection. Why? He said, because you honor your guests, and you provide for the needy, and you take care of uh, of the orphans, and he mentioned three other qualities, or two other qualities from amongst them was that you help those who are not just the needy, but you help those who have been faced with, with calamities. Now, if we look at that description of Abu Bakr al-Siddiq, when this man said, no, you feed the needy, he's talking about the Muslim needy, or he's talking about the needy in general. And he said, what well, well, tasilu and you keep ties of kinship. And the majority of his family, when you look at the kinship, they were not Muslims. Feeding the needy, taking care of the orphans, helping. If it was just something that Abu Bakr did for the Muslims, stay with me. If it was just something that he did for the Muslims, why would Ibn Dighinna look at that as a virtue? You're supposed to take care of your people. But no, he was doing this for society as a whole. This is the exact same description. Ibn Dighinna describing Abu Bakr al-Siddiq is the exact same description that Khadija made of the Prophet wasallam after Jibril came to him that time, the first for the first time, and he was so scared wasallam that he didn't know what was going on. And Khadija said to the Prophet wasallam, Wallahi, La yuzik Allah. By Allah, Allah will never disgrace you. You do what? You feed the poor. You keep ties of kinship. You 
feed the need, uh, you, you take care of the orphans and you help those who are in need, right? Same exact description. And so this was our prophet, alayhi salatu wa salam, who even before he was a Muslim, was known amongst his people as a sadiq al-ameen. And he was truthful, and he was trustworthy, and he took care of the people in, at the society at large. And so this is, as Muslims, we have to begin to do this because it is a means of da'wah, number one. And number two, it is a means of protecting our institutions. It is a means of protecting our institutions because now when people attack the Muslims and people say that we are terrorists and people say they will be our first defenders. They will be the first ones to say the people, not, not us. We won't have to defend ourselves. They will be the ones to say, not these Muslims. They do this. They feed the needy in this neighborhood. They take care of the orphans in this neighborhood. They do this and they do that. And so this is something that you know, we have to keep in mind as, as we expand. I know that I am out of time, but I just want to reiterate that we have a very important role moving forward, that we cannot continue from today on. We cannot continue to run things the way that we've been running them and expect change. And we have the ability. Well, alhamdulillah. Yes, there may have been a time when we had to be on the defensive or a time when we were in survival mode, but we're, we're past that now. We can finally be idhnillahi ta'ala. We have the resources. We need to pull those resources together, inshallah ta'ala, so that we can start at this here place and begin to build for the future, inshallah ta'ala. Mark my words, for those of us who live, inshallah ta'ala, for the next 20 years, if we continue down this path, we will see Islam in a much better state than it is today, and we'll be able to pass on sustainable institutions to the generations that come. Wallahu ta'ala adam wa sallallahu wa sallam wa barak ala nabiyyina Muhammad. Now, before we close out, you're going to... Sorry? No, please, before prayer. Huh? Yeah. John, Imam John has a few words that he's going to, uh, to share, because this is something, this is a vision that I've had for some years, and it's something that we've discussed, John and I have discussed over the years, and, and many of the other du'at and professionals as well, that it is time that we pull our resources together, and John is going to talk about, Imam John is going to talk about how to do that, inshallah. Bismillah, alhamdulillah, wa salatu wa salamu ala rasulillah, wa ala alihi wa ashabihi wa man tabi'ahum bi isanin ila yawm edini wa ba'd. Just a few moments before we begin, we begin for the prayer, um, as Sheikh Tahir mentioned, um, we have been in discussion, uh, Sheikh Tahir, Sheikh Rashid, a number of the other mashayikh and uh, colleagues from various universities, Islamic institutions, imams, etc., as well as professionals of relative fields, we have been discussing how we can stabilize Muslim identity, secure our financial future, as well as normalize our presence as a faith group in the United States. So among this team, which has to grow, we have been developing a very practical and a scalable model that can be implemented in any community. Scalable. Based on your size, you can implement something that will address the most pressing short-term and long-term challenges that you are likely to face. So here, you're at GCLEA. This is a community center that serves Cherry Hill and the surrounding townships. As much as I'd love Sheikh Daher to lock those doors, as he said, and have a fundraiser. He's going to leave that up to me for my community. You guys can have your lock-in in your own communities. So what I want to do is, instead of talking about theory, I want to give you an example of what it could look like in your own community based on this practical approach. Three things we're discussing, which is stabilizing Islamic identity. So here, in this community, we have been working towards these goals 
since we opened, and that's 2010. Very short life. So we began by opening an after-school program because there was not an Islamic school in the area. So we would supplement their academics with religious studies to help develop that identity. And I give you one example from this because this is a beautiful example. It's very important. We had one young participant in the group. His name was Yaqub. In public school, when you call the roll, the teacher murdered the name, of course, at the beginning of the year. And he said, no, miss, my name is Jacob. Translated it over to standard English. My name's Jacob. And she would ask, where are you from? He was originally from the Muslim world. And he was shy to say where he was from. When he started with our program, halfway through the school year, the roll time came around. The teacher said, Jacob, are you here? He said, ma'am, my name is Yaqub. She tried to pronounce Yaqub. He says, no, Yaqub. Corrected her pronunciation. Because we were able to provide them, these young children, an opportunity to stabilize that identity. It was wishy-washy. He was in hiding. After school program, Sunday school was offered. Seminary is in the works to be developed. Islamic studies for adults. And a full-time Islamic school is in the future. These are institutions that we all understand. We all are after in our own communities. The key, 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 key here, 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 and I remind you of the example given by Sheikh Tahir moments ago about Omar radiallahu anhu and that piece of land. Setting it as an endowment to continue to support the da'wah, Islamic efforts, to continue to support those institutions that are so needed to stabilize identity it continues until this very day. That, my dear brothers and sisters, is what you call a legacy. That's a legacy. We need to be thinking about what will be the legacy of this community, of you. What will be your legacy? Will you leave your children a burden? Because I'm telling you now, they're already looking at it that way. A burden. a burden. We built, we the, built the biggest, biggest the best. best, 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 best. But, guess but guess what? It came with a budget. budget, 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 budget. We, did we did not secure, 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 secure those institutions those financially. financially. So, our children, so our children, not only they're going to have their own, own struggles, struggles financially and challenges, and challenges but we but just, just added, added a huge, huge weight, weight, weight on their shoulders. So... The idea, the concept of the endowment is the legacy that we need to leave. We started that here in this community. We started a pilot program, a beta, if you will, invested in local property. It builds equity for the community. And it relieves those lock-in fundraisers. So instead of having to ask for half a million dollars for whatever your scale is, we can say, guess what? Because of our investments, we only need to supplement. We need 100000 And part of that's going to be invested. That's a legacy. That is securing the finances. And lastly, before I give you what I want you to do, what actually what Sheikh Tahir wants me to have you do, is normalizing our presence here. We have to normalize Islam in the eyes of the average American. Like the other faith groups have done, the other minority groups are still doing, it's normal to be Muslim in America. And that's only going to happen when we interact when we put our best foot forward and we have something to show and something to provide. In this community center right here, one of the, I think, spearhead, one of our pilot projects for this is opening a free clinic. 
This community has been blessed with numerous doctors and people of other skill sets that came together and said, we want to offer our services, not just for the Muslim community here, but we want to open this clinic for all of our neighbors. No health insurance? You're welcome. No documentation? You're welcome. And you know what? The staff is not even all Muslim because they bought into that idea, the concept of giving health, free health care to those that can't afford it. And they have taken us as leaders in this township. They will know of this masjid as the one that hosts a free health clinic and serves not just their own interests, but serves the community at large. They will begin to look up to us, to respect us, and they will extend their hands to us. And they are doing that now, believe it or not. That health clinic is being supported by the hospital system here. They've endorsed this health clinic because the nature of it is universal. Regardless of faith, regardless of ethnic background, we have now taken our seat at the table of our community. This is just a couple of examples of what it could look like in your community. So here's the thing. Besides the theory, what are we going to do? What, what can we do today? Many people are thinking, well, that's, that's, that's beyond what we have ever... We haven't even talked about that. The dialogue begins now. And the first step is getting to know each other. If you understand what was mentioned this evening, if you have opened your heart to that idea, perhaps even bought into a little bit of it tonight. Right now, we need to know who you are. Let's get to know each other, what we can do, what resources we have. Because I'll tell you this, the Muslim community is full of resources. A lot of times, we don't know what each other does, what we can bring to the table. But we have all the resources we need right here. And I can guarantee in this building tonight, we have enough resources. And I'm not just talking about money. I'm talking about your skills that we can have a huge impact on this entire region. Not Cherry Hill, not Philadelphia, the entire Northeast. Just from this group right here. And this is not a lot. So let's get to know each other. What can you do? gclea.org. That's our website. We've posted a survey on the homepage, gclea.org. The survey is entitled uh, Sustainability, Obtaining Sustainability Resource Assessment. It's going to take you two minutes or less. Basic contact information. What is your area of expertise? What is your area of interest? And would you be interested in joining a team that can leave a legacy? You could do it right now. You've got your smartphones. We're going to make the event. We're going to make the event. A few minutes for you to pull out your smart devices. Everyone, if you got, hopefully got some data on your phone still left over. Not too much faith. Take a little Facebook diet. Stay off the tabloids of Twitter, etc. Go ahead. Pull out your phone. GCLEA.org. On the homepage, you'll see a link. It says, Attaining Sustainability Resource Survey. You click that. It'll take you to a survey. Two minutes or less, you'll be done. It'll be time for prayer. And we can begin moving forward. Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar, Ashhadu an la ilaha illa Allah. I 
أشهد أن لا إله إلا الله أشهد أن محمد رسول الله أشهد أن محمد رسول الله حي على الصلاة حي على الصلاة حي على الفلاح حي على الفلاح الله أكبر الله أكبر لا إله إلا 